Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for coming to listen to me. As an 18th centurist, knowing that Boston was the center of the English-speaking world of that period intellectually, it doesn't surprise me that so many people today are willing to come out and listen to a lecture. Now, what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk for about 50 minutes, and then I'm going to answer questions, okay? What I'm going to talk about is the way in which historical atlases offer us dim different images of the past. But I want to start, in order to locate this, by actually briefly talking about the problems of mapping anyway, the, the modern age. And I want to start with a device, a globe. You know, if you would go to teaching school, which I've never done, thankfully, they will tell you that you have to have sort of visual aids. So here is my first visual aid. Okay? Now, I did check beforehand, A, that it wasn't an antique, and B, that it was light. The latter is more important than the former. Now, you might well say that there is no real problem of knowing what to put on a map. Um, and at the level of the globe, that is fairly true. Um, th in fact, the world, as you may know, is not a perfect sphere. It is actually flattened at the, at the poles. So even, uh, um, even a sphere is, is actually wrong. But as, a, as a, a scale model, this is not bad. I mean, you know, the world is roughly spherical. But if you just look at this, there are several things that would immediately come to mind. First of all, the way up we have the globe. Okay. Second of all, the, fa the fact that the globe, when we look at it, is always in light. Well, actually, as we know, for much of the world's population at any one time, the world is in darkness. But thirdly, much more importantly, what have we got on it? Now, this globe is organized, and this is not a criticism. You know, I have a globe at home. It's organized similarly. This globe is organized as a political map of the world. It marks nice, clear lines which delimit states. We actually know in practice that many of these lines are much less clear-cut on the earth. But this is, what is the, this is what, if you like, is the hierarchy of knowledge offered, that's the jargon, offered by this map. It is a political map of the world. Well, actually, there are whole other ways that you could offer a map of the world. You could map it physically. All right? You know, in other words, in terms of mountains, and mountains don't feature on this at all. Um, you could map it in terms of land use. Um, you could map it in terms of population density. Individual cities show up on this world, on this map, but they are just pinpoints. And that's just the globe. But the globe, at least, is relatively accurate because the world is a three-dimensional shape. Now, once you move to the map, you are in more trouble. There is no way you can produce a map. A map is a symbolization in two dimensions of something that in, actually exists in the real world in three dimensions. So for a start, as you well know, may know, if you do a map of the entire world, something is going to go wrong. Okay? Um, you have, you, generally, it's either um, the, uh, the angle um, or sometimes it's the space. You know, an equal space map, for example, like the Peter's world map, very famous one, um, is actually wrong on its angles. Okay? And so on and so forth. Once you come down to a more detailed map, you also then have the problem, again, that I referred to with this. I think we can put that, we can dispense with our visual aid. We then have the problem of what exactly do we put on a map? If you were mapping Boston, for example, what do you choose to do? I mean, actually, this is very rude of me, but the director, I'm sure, knows best what to do with his own globe. Uh, the, 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 uh, he can play with it discreetly during the lecture. Um, if you have a map, as you will know, the classic way in which maps are organized, and your country is no different to mine, is that we organize maps in reference to streets. Okay? Well, of course, that's all very well if what you want to do is to drive around the city, as in fact I, I, I did this morning, but it's doesn't tell you about life. For a start, these are maps in two, di two dimensions. It gives you no idea of the three-dimensionality of the city. It assumes, of course, that the prime, way of, prime thing that you ought to be showing in a city are, 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 you know, are the routes. But there are a whole series of other things. The things that you will know in your mental world, this is a nice neighborhood. That's a neighborhood I don't want to get caught dead at even at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, those are the kind of things that you don't put on maps. So in other words, maps are selective. Okay? Even the most obvious map is selective. Uh, they don't offer you the qualitative views that you will actually have when you perceive a neighborhood. And there are selectivities in all sorts of ways. For example, you can take, I'm going to be showing you historical ones, but I'm just talking about the present day for a minute. You can actually take uh, the classic map we use, which is an equal area cartogram. In other words, 
a, a, a space on that map, a section of that map supposedly showing 100 square miles is the same there as here. Right? So it's an equal area cartogram. That's our standard map. There's no particular reason for that. You have a very interesting map of the United States if you map it with equal people cartograms. In other words, the spaces on the map signifies, shall we say, 10 million people. So that you take a map and suddenly Montana ceases to be of any importance. Okay? Now again, and remember, these are the sort of maps that are used, for example, for mapping congressional districts. I'm not just talking about some abstract idea here. There are real maps that are produced that are different from the classical maps that you see. Now, you go to the past and you see that even more. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be giving you indications of how history can be perceived differently through maps. But I want you at every stage to bear in mind that we shouldn't be sitting, and if I do it, I'm wrong, we shouldn't sit there being smugly superior and thinking that our maps are necessarily better. Okay? Let me start off. Now, I want to start off with something that you're going to say to me very rightly is not a map. Okay? And you're absolutely right, it isn't a map. This comes, though, from one of the first historical atlases. A historical atlas by a man called Lesage, which was produced at the very beginning of the 19th century, uh, first published in London. There were also editions in Paris, St. Petersburg, Philadelphia. It was the most successful of the early 19th century historical atlases. And what Lesage did was produce what he called geographical, genealogi genealogical, and historical maps. Now, only one of those geographical maps ma matches up to our idea of a map. In other words, the depiction of space um, in a diagrammatic form. That is our idea of a map. Um, but the point to bear in mind is actually, if you look at modern historical atlases, you will find that they also are suffused with text as well as maps. And an interesting question, this is just a minor point when you come to an atlas, is what, in fact, do you anticipate in an atlas? To people in the early 19th century, they anticipated this kind of information as much as they anticipated the ordinary image. This is the more classic 19th century map. This comes from Droysen's Historical Atlas of the World, German, late 19th century. Um, this is from my personal copy at home. Um, there is a subtext to these maps. They're beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And one of the things is they show the triumph of, the, of cartography at the period, very fine line, uh, um, line, and also wonderful use of color. You just simply could not produce maps of that type 100 years early. But there was a subtext of these maps. The subtext was a clear and explicit political idea. This shows Germany in the 14th century. You can see the title on the top. Um, what the idea is that Germany was stronger by the time Droysen produced his maps because Germany had been uni unified by Prussia. So this map, which might appear to be just an ordinary objective map, is also carrying with it a subliminal political lesson. This comes, I'm throwing you up in rapid sequence a lot of different images to show you the kind of variety of historical maps. This comes from the best ever American historical atlas, the Charles R. Paulin Historical Atlas of the United States, which was published in 1932. It's interesting, there has not been as good or as comprehensive a historical atlas of the United States since 1932. I, if people want to ask me afterwards, I'll tell them why I think that is, but that's just speculation. Why Paulin was so good was that he mapped not just politics, but he mapped the sort of information that people were just simply not putting in historical atlases in that period. There, as you can see, are maps of the spread of prohibition. Well, that was simply not the kind of topic that people put in a historical atlas in 1932. They put maps of old battles. They put maps of the spread of America. They put maps of that, such like things, but not maps of this kind of topic. The other reason why Paulin is a very good historical atlas is he actually did something which is very unusual in historical atlases, very unusual in any atlases. He actually took the audience by the hand and treated them as intelligent people. Now, as you will know from most books and most lectures, people don't generally treat audiences as intelligent. They generally act as if they knew everything and the audience knows nothing, which is absurd. Paulin, what he did at the beginning of his atlas is he produces 
a two-page, very detailed, tight, narrowly printed preface in which he actually offers the audience a chart showing the percentage of the maps that are political topics, the percentage of the maps that are economic topics, the percentage of the maps that are social topics, and so on, and then discusses with them why he has that choice. Okay? In other words, it is a self-reverential and referential atlas. It knows it is a great work of scholarship, but it is referring to itself as having made choice, as explicitly having made choice. It is not assuming that the audience should automatically think that whatever it presents is right. Uh, the corollary of that for me, by the way, is a simple one. You will not, for example, notice any Nazi maps in historical atlases slides for a simple reason. I can't reproduce them for you because they're held in copyright libraries and they don't reproduce the images readily. I can only reproduce you slides of images that I've got in my library or had easy access to. You know, <laughs> we have to be aware that the choices of what is presented at every stage are framed by what is possible. Okay. Now, here we come right... Is this, by the way, I mean, my eyesight is very poor. Is this focused correctly? Is this fo no. Can we have some... Because my eyesight's very poor. Can we have some slightly tighter focusing, please? It's always difficult introducing maps if your eyesight yourself is poor. <laughs> Thank you. Well, oops, there we go again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right? Um, this is from the Dawling Kindersley Atlas of World History, which came out about four years ago. Uh, which I know a bit about because I edited it. Um, now, now I'm, I'm not saying it's the best atlas for a minute. I'm just saying it was something I did a bit of work on. Um, the interesting thing here is the little map at the top, which you can see just an, a, enough of, which shows you, it's making explicit to you, that it is offering a different projection and a different perspective. See, that little ma map at the top is a lo locator map. And as you will be aware... That is not the shape of the Pacific and East Asia that you're usually used to seeing. I ought to mention there is no particular reason to have any shape. There is not a shape that is correct. I mean, bear that in mind. North is not the correct shape to put at the top. You know, you go to the Southern Hemisphere, um, you can look at, for example, MacArthur's Universal Corrective Map, which has the south as the top, it has the meridian running through Sydney, and it actually carries the imprint on it, Australia is best, just in case you haven't got the message. Um, I have a map at home, which is a New Zealand map, which offers essentially exactly the same notion, except obviously you will be not surprised to hear that they have the same view about New Zealand. There is no reason to believe that north should be at the top of the map. In fact, in most European maps until the 16th century, east was at the top. Okay? The Greenwich Meridian was only established by international treaty as the zero meridian line in the 1880s. I think it was 1884, in fact. The Americans didn't accept that, and the French didn't accept that till 1912-13. Does anybody know? It's question time here. Does anybody know where the American meridian was? Where, where did zero go through in American maps of the 19th century, unless they were actually copying from the Brits? Anybody know? Right. Uh, PowerPoint, you know, I'm fascinated in James Bond. My next trip to America is to lecture on James Bond. And as you will know, the series of uh, Thunderball, there is, they just demonstrate what PowerPoint means. You know, the man presses the button and you get electrocuted for not answering the right question. And that's, <laughs> that's PowerPoint. I get the, you know, I have the point and you get the power. No, um, the, uh, no, the American meridian by act of Congress ran through the naval yard in Washington. The French meridian ran through the observatory in Paris, and so on. The Spaniards had their own meridian line. Portuguese meridian line ran through the lighthouse at Cape St. Vincent. So the fact is there is no inherent reason why you should have the meridian in the middle. I mean, why, for example? Um, if you want to demonstrate something, I mean, you know, you should think about what information you wish to show on the map and then how best to direct and, and point the map what projection and perspective you use in order to convey the information. Frequently, I will be showing you in these slides one map which is an upside-down map. Frequently maps, which is not one of mine, I hasten to add, frequently maps actually, if you offer a very arresting perspective or projection, can give an idea of linkages between places that would not otherwise appear obvious. Okay? That's another one, same idea, showing, as it were, communist influence in East and South Asia. 
Now, this is from the Times Historical Atlas of the World, the 1978 first edition, edited by Geoffrey Barraclough. Um, this was important. For, I mean, obviously, you've got the problems that you have with every atlas. I mean, I take it that you have technical problems, like, for example, let me use this technology I've got here. Assuming I can. Actually, I'll just use my fingers. They're just as good. You see here the guttering down the middle. It is always a problem with a map on a two-page spread as to when you have, as, as, to, as to the guttering. Um, but you see here what the Times was very, very good at was offering a perspective that enables you to encompass all of Eurasia plus North Africa. Yes, madam? Yeah, I know. I can't do that. That's done from up there, so I'm sorry. Um, the, um, and you can see how, um, just if you just look at the general outline, it gives you a map which, which uh, conveys the trade routes. Uh, yes, could we try the focus again? Sorry, could we? There. Spread of Islam, again trying to, down here, you see from Mecca, showing you where they're centering, this is the Times Atlas, they're centering the map over here, and they're spreading out to the different places so that you get, for example, the spread of Islam across North Africa into Spain and France. You get the spread of Islam into Turkestan and the battle with the Chinese at 751. Um, again, quite an, this is from the Times perspective, this map is much more arresting than the map at the top. The map at the top is the classic kind of, uh, and that's the map of Sunnis and Shiites, as you can see. The map at the top is a flat map, which really ha is very unattractive, very poor in cartographical design. Um, in terms of, for those of you who are interested in design issues, the other thing that this map, that this spread, a two-pager is known as a spread, the other thing that this spread shows you is a kind of rather conservative, and I don't use conservative in a pejorative sense, I just mean that it's not as up-to-date as something that's come out since, a rather conservative boxed-in maps at the top, you see, with a, with a box around them, whereas down here you have a map that doesn't appear in a box. And when you have maps that don't appear in a box, they actually look, they integrate much better with the rest of the spread. So the most traditional way is to box your maps. I actually happen to think that unboxed maps look much better. But again, there's nothing in the water that says you have to have box maps or unboxed maps. In a sense, what the designer is doing is playing with your response. Okay? You also see in this particular map the standard hero of all mapping. The standard hero of all historical mapping is the arrow. <laughs> now, the arrow serves as an image for all sorts of things. Spread of trade, spread of conquest, spread of religion, spread of the Black Death. No doubt they'll be producing arrows to show the spread of SARS. But the point about the arrow is it looks superficially accurate, but it isn't particularly superficially accurate. I mean, for example, let's just take this. We have here Islam spreading across North Africa, okay, to Tripoli. Well, we actually don't particularly know how it spread from Egypt to Tripoli. It's more likely that it went by inland waterway with merchants. You know, it's more likely that it went along the coast. If it did go on the landward route, it would more likely to have actually followed the coast. There's not much point going straight across there. It's dry. You know, it would have much more likely to have got... But, of course, what you do is you want to make it look accurate. You want your arrows to look vigorous. So, so, so there are certain shapes and forms your arrows have to take. And in a way, they are, in a sense, a fiction, which then gives the viewer the idea that you have got the exact route. The other thing is these arrows, and again, everybody does this. I've done this myself, so I'm, you know, uh, mayor culpa. Um, what on earth do we make of the width of the arrows? Now, in this map, all arrows are of equal width, which therefore suggests that the expansion of Islam is equally important towards Corsica and towards the Caucasus. Rubbish. Okay? In other words, there is a non-scaled use of the arrow, but the implication to the viewer is that, in fact, this has all been carefully thought through. Black and white, this is from an English atlas of the 1950s. As you can see, the man is actually, uh, the map maker is actually making you a, a, he's very didactic. 
the lesson is very clear. The importance of the English Channel in war, so you produce 1066, the Norman Conquest, 1588, the Spanish Armada, 1805, Napoleon, 1940, the Battle of Britain. Okay? Very, very, very didactic there. Uh, actually works quite well. I mean, it doesn't, it's not exactly off inviting debate, but it actually works quite well. The other thing that it reminds us is this. This is black and white. A lot of atlases, particularly a lot of school atlases, this was originally a school atlas, a lot of school atlases are black and white. Uh, we shouldn't assume that just because an atlas is better in terms of its production values, more use of color, larger scale, uh, more sophisticated cartography, I mean, this is, these are very simplistic maps, we shouldn't assume actually that it necessarily is better at achieving its function. One should judge atlases like anything else, like television programs, like political speech. I've just done a book which is, um, which is coming out next year, a detailed monograph on parliament and foreign policy in the 18th century. If you're judging parliamentary speeches it is on foreign policy, it is not necessarily the ones that are most acute in terms of analyzing the situation that are the best speeches. The best speeches may be the rabble-rouser speeches at that moment that in fact get people to agree with whatever the speaker wants. Okay? Exactly the same with maps. If what the purpose of the map is, is to make a pedagogic point, then often the simplistic, pared down, black and white, is the better way to do it. Okay? And one has to bear that in mind. One has to move away from the idea that there's a clear set, set of judgments. Now, this is the map of scholarship. This comes from the Historical Atlas of Suffolk. I've got a number of maps from the Historical Atlas of Scott Suffolk because it's one of the best uh, recent historical atlases of the British region. Suffolk is an English county, okay, uh, in East Anglia. And this is based on research carried out by the local um, extension college. Uh, in other words, private individuals who, as a hobby, were interested in history and did research. Actually, that's how a lot of local history is now done, not by academics, they haven't got the time. Um, and, well, they don't have the time in Britain. In America, obviously, they all sit there making earnest comments about the New York Times. Um, and in this case, in this case um, what you've got here in the Atlas, what they're mapping is the 1674 hearth tax. They're mapping the percentage of the poor, okay? So you've got here a scale. You've got here the number of households, and at the back of the atlas, you have every single map is, is using this parochial structure. These, e, these are the boundaries of the individual parishes. And at the back of the atlas, you have a plastic sheet, which you put over these maps, and it will read off the names of all the parishes. Okay? Now, this is scholarship. You cannot get this information in any more detail than this. The information was originally kept in, at the parochial level, so this is as far as it can go. This shows you, you know, this enables you to take that tax and to say where poverty was most and where poverty was least and then to try and gauge, because you obviously you link it up with economic criteria. It gives you a scale, one to four miles. It gives you a direction finder, that is the direction finder for north, and you're away. It's not a better map than my last map. It's a different map, but for its purpose, it is excellent. Okay? Interestingly enough, there is absolutely, mean, not for 1674 so much, there is no reason why you shouldn't have these kind of maps produced in the United States. I mean, you know, it would really be very, very interesting. One of the things that's really quite disappointing is that although some individual American states have got very good historical atlases, on the whole they don't, which is, which is disappointing. Um, now, this is a bad map, and I can say that because I was involved with this one. Um, this comes from the Times Atlas of Europe, um, and it's a bad map for a simple reason. Um, the Times dragged in four scholars, and they, they had this idea. They were going to produce maps of Europe at set periods of time, and they wanted the political boundaries shown. And uh, I was given the Middle Ages. I don't know much about the Middle Ages, but that's what I was given. And um, you, you write the text, you help them with the map. Why is it a bad map? For a simple reason. What the Times did was it took 20th century values, this came out about 10 years ago, took 20th century values and extrapolated them into the past. 20th century value is precise sovereign territory with accurately delimited frontiers. That was true not at all of 1030. You know, 
this line, for example, would have between, between, say, the Catalan counties and France would have meant nothing in 1030. France didn't mean anything in 1030. The effective authority of the King of France was Paris and a few of the counties around Paris, and that was it. Okay? Um, I explained that to the Times. They said, if you're interested in the job, that's what you do. Um, <laughs> The, the section before me was done by Rosamond McKittrick, who's the professor of medieval history at Cambridge, and she said to me, she said, I thought this was appalling, I thought this was truly appalling, she said, yeah, this is a silly atlas, but she says, nobody I know is ever going to look at it, so does it matter? Um, <laughs> which, um, which I thought, actually, I thought that really sums up some of the problems. Um, I mean, the... <laughs> Here we go, 1466... Um, and, you know, you've got the same problem. I actually refer in the first paragraph, I actually say, I'm trying to give the readers a code here. I'm talking about the implementation of firm frontiers as starting in this period. I mean, in other words, by this stage, it's starting to get more accurate. It is starting to get more accurate. The authority of the King of France, for example, is, would now reach to Provence. Um, but, you know, the, the fact of the matter is it had not been accurate for the earlier periods. Back to Sussex. Suffolk, sorry, back to Suffolk. Here again you see, a mu this is enclosure and reclamation. It is showing the size of the area of enclosure as if evidenced by enclosure acts, parliamentary enclosure acts, in the 18th century. And here you see the data very clearly emerges. Where is enclosure most sustained? Around the Breck land in the northwest and onto the sandy areas in the northeast, but particularly in the Breck land. In other words, here... What you do is you take the usual historical statement in the 18th century enclosure was concentrated in the Breckland, which is the kind of thing that you would read in a history book, and bang, you can give it precision. Okay? A map can give you a precision that text cannot provide. Okay? Back to Lesage. This is one of the first historical atlases, sorry, first historical maps in English. It's a spaghetti map by a spaghetti map, what I mean is you can look at showing the roots of invaders of England, and it is totally ahistorical. In other words, we have down this blue line at the bottom, William the Conqueror coming across in 1066. We have the red line coming down from Scotland, Bonnie Prince Charlie in 1745, as well as everybody in between. It runs together points across a time period. That actually reflects a practical problem with mapping which is the problem of simultaneity. If you depict a map, let us, show, let us say, uh, I'll give you an example of this, from the East German historical atlas produced by the communists in the beginning of the 1970s. The East Germans produced a, a really very fine, in terms of the cartographic quality, the color use, the precision of line, and a really very spurious and fallacious in terms of the content. So what they did was they had maps in there, for example, of Britain and the United States in uh, the 20th century. The map of the United States in the 20th century showed race riots in the 1960s. It showed, urban, it showed industrial disputes in the 1930s. It showed strike bait breaking in the 1900s. Et and the point was quite clear. The whole of America was suffused with signs of social and ethnic conflict, therefore proving that that was the nature of America. Now, what that captures, I mean, apart from obviously it was silly and communist propaganda, but what it actually captures is a more serious problem in mapping, which is the issue of simultaneity. If you are mapping something in, say, the 18th century, let's just say you were doing a map of Europe in the 18th century, and you put, were trying, you put on it every single peasant rising, then the impression you would create is that peasant risings were very common in Europe in the 18th century. In fact, they weren't. But obviously, if you put all of the peasant risings over a period of 100 years, you give the impression that they're very, that they're very common. And the problem, I mean, this map is depicting over eight centuries of history. It obviously gives you the idea that England was repeatedly invaded. Well, over eight centuries of history, you will have a certain number of invasions. You see, this issue, how do you make a map? So that one of the classic problems historically is what kind of time range do you have on that map? Okay. Um, 1834 here, the Croix Historical Atlas. This is one of the better of the early 19th century ones. It moves on from the Lesage that I've already uh, depicted. He's still going for an attempt at a false precision of line in terms of the boundaries, 
uh, in the sense that the boundaries in the 6th century, this is at the end of the 6th century, this map, sorry, it depicts the end of the 6th century. Um, the, in practice, the, you know, th these kind of lines did not match up to real things on the ground, but at least he's trying. And the other thing is, he's giving you the benefit of a very accurate physical background in terms of the rivers, so that you can actually fix and locate his lines as meaning something if you have an atlas of Europe at that time. Um, this is Europe at the end of the 7th century, and we had the 6th century last time. Again, you know, you compare the two, you'd get the idea of change. Uh, in fact, the changes are much more obscure. I mean, scholars today would find it very, it's the Dark Ages. Scholars today would be, find it very difficult to define what was going on in the 7th century in any detail. They certainly would not be able to locate it as easily as that. But in 19th century terms, that's what you had to do. The 19th century, the age of the nation state, the age of the development of nationalism, people wanted to know where was France and Germany. They had clear ideas. So they assumed that in the past, you should get the same. Um, German historical atlas by a man called Spruner, revised by Theodore Menck. This is the 1881 uh, atlas. Um, now, here you've got, just like my Droysen earlier, Enormous amount of information uh, due to much better printing technology, the use of paper that can hold a far greater amount of information. Uh, the German fascination with battles, well, I think that's unfair on the Germans, other people were fascinated with battles as well in the 19th century. So on the top you have a list of battles and you won't be surprised to hear that it culminates with the surroundings of Paris, the, the area around Paris, and of course the Germans had besieged Paris in 1870-1871 in the Franco-Prussian War. Um, okay. um, this is the Poole Historical Atlas, the British one. Um, again, very strong interest in political boundaries. It is political boundaries that people want to look at in the 19th century. There are many other things that you could have shown in Scotland uh, for that period. That you, you know, uh, these are the ecclesiastical ones, but of the diocese. It's not, for example, showing you where the actual... Um, signs of religious devotion were. It gives you, as it were, territorial control. German historical atlas, Middle Europe in the age of the Carolingians. Again, 19th century obsession with territorialism. Um, this is from the historical atlases that were being used when I was a child. This is from the Ramsey Muir historical atlas. First came out in 1928 and then went through a number of editions. I wasn't around in 1928. Then, then went through a number of subsequent editions used by children. Now, these were the only maps in that atlas on Australasia. Okay, the only maps. And, you know, that wasn't too bad. It wasn't a very big atlas. It had something like 64 map pages, or I can't remember, but about that. 65, I think. Yes, it was the last one, up to 65 the last spread. But there's something that obviously emerges from that, um, which is, you can forget it as far as the Aborigines are concerned, the history of Australasia begins when the Brits arrive. Okay? It's exactly what you'd expect in historical atlases of that period. If you look at the current historical atlas of Australia, there is at least an attempt to map pre-contact, you know, civilization. The historical atlas of New Zealand, which is absolutely superb one by Malcolm McKinnon, which came out about six years ago, which I've got at home, uh, is really excellent. The entire first quarter of the atlas is devoted to uh, the surviving evidence of Maori civilization, you know, Ma Maori ideas of space and so on. But of course, <laughs> you know, mapping of an earlier generation, that was the last thing you would think of showing. Okay. Uh, there's a very good French map, incidentally. There's New Caledonia. You can see the island in the Pacific. There's a marvelous, there's a series of only four maps for New Caledonia's history, but there's a marvelous French one. Uh, it was a French colony in which they actually try and map the dream lines of New Caledonian society. New Caledonian society, like Aboriginal society in Australia, had dream lines, and they try and map it out. And it gives you an idea of space in a way that is very different to the colonists' idea of space. Now, here we go, British Historical Atlas, and of course, what do we show as battles? Well, reasonably enough, I suppose, English victories from the medieval period. Battle of Cressy, spelt in the English way of that period, not the French way, of course, uh, 1346, beat the French. Battle of Poitiers, beat the French. The bottom one is Agincourt, beat the French. You know? I mean, there, uh, you will not be surprised, sorry, here it is again, you will not be surprised to hear that in the French historical atlases, they do not have the same 
choice of battles. Um, <laughs> Ireland, the 1916 uprising. This is from a school historical, an English school historical atlas. Um, it's one way to show a historical atlas of Ireland in the 1916 rising. I mean, you could, for example, show where people died. You know, different ways of doing it. Um, but I'm just showing you the kind of material that was presented at school level. Here, yeah, I think we've already had that one. Now, this is from one of the best historical atlases. Um, the New Zealand one is one of the best, but this is probably even better. This comes from the three-volume Historical Atlas of Canada, published by the University Press of Toronto uh, between the late 70s and the early 90s. It came out, the three volumes came out at different dates. And why is this so good? Well, I mean, this is not cartographically a particularly beautiful map spread because the colour isn't particularly beautiful. But why it is so good is for both content terms and design terms. The design terms here are wonderful. In other words, instead of boxed-in information in the centre, it flows. It flows beautifully. Okay? Um, the, research ter the research terms is excellent because this information uh, this was, was, but was based on actually... Um, you know, people going out and finding something new as opposed to what often happens, which is, can we have this slightly focused up, please, is what often happens, which is just, re you know, repeating existing stuff. This is from the Dawling Kindersley, The Agricultural Revolution. No, these aren't focused terribly well. They should be better focused than this. Can we have it focused up? Well, don't worry. Trade in the classical world. Could we have it focused a bit more? Sorry. There. Africa, again, no particular reason to have Africa in any given shape. Okay, this is just as good as a way of showing African trade routes and the spread of Islam in Africa as having it from the bottom up. Using this projection, you focus on North Africa, for which we have most information. If you have a bottom-to-top view of Africa, we actually don't have very much information on Africa from 500 to 1500. Could we actually, sorry, can we try and focus it a bit more? All right, there. Those are African states of the early modern period. The research for that was done by a chap called Jim Thornton. Um, very difficult to map. I mean, he's a great expert, so Thornton knows about 25 native languages from that era. Extraordinarily difficult to map the native states because, of course, these are non-paper societies. <coughs> They don't actually leave maps of them. And the, all the Europeans knew is what happened exactly on the coastline where they were getting the slaves from. But they knew nothing about the interior. So that's based essentially on um, a mosaic of oral history sources, etc. And you can see, in this case, what Thornton has done, which is so impressive, what Thornton has done, which is so impressive, has leaved, left the page blank when he doesn't know what the situation is. Now, if you see an atlas where the page is left blank in sections, you know you're dealing with a high-quality product. Because it is terribly tempting, if you don't know, to just, you know, colour it all in. After all, the punters back at home are not going to spend their time thinking, is that where Sabi stops and where, you know, you know. But in fact, what, this, what he's doing here is really high-quality work. Back to Suffolk. Here again, I'm deliberately moving through different atlases because I'm trying to indicate there's no inherent hierarchy of quality. Okay, there are different types of maps. This is what I'm trying to do. This is the Peasants' Revolt of 1381. Now, the point about the Peasants' Revolt is, again, usually, if you look at the textbooks, it just says that the, you know, an area of support for the peasant uprising was East Anglia. Here, you actually break it down to a parish level, and you show that in a lot of parishes there was support, and in other areas, for example, near the coast, that big central area there, no support whatsoever. And then you can actually start to think, well, why is there support in some areas and not to others? In other words, you can take the whole subject forward in a way that was impossible before the mapping existed. This is an upside-down map. This comes from the, historical, the Times Historical Atlas. Um, this comes from the first edition. Now, the point about this map was to show the strategic position of the Adriatic from Venice's perspective. There's Venice on the bottom left, all right? 
There's the, as you will realize, this is the opposite way around to how we usually see it. We usually see Venice as at the top of the Adriatic. Uh, there is the Adriatic, and the point of the map maker is that, you, you, I'll just tell you what he says on the left, the point of the map maker is that it was crucially important for the Venetians to have these fortresses in order to control their access to the Mediterranean. Okay? And actually, the upside-down map works brilliantly. Well, if you look at the current edition of the Times Historical Atlas, it's now on the fifth edition, you'll find this map isn't there. It wasn't there in the fourth edition either. Why not? Because apparently enough people wrote in and complained that they found it upsetting to have the Adriatic put the wrong way around, um, that they took the map out and replaced it with something far more conventional. Okay? I mean, I know that. I did a book some years ago on Culloden and the 45, in which I had a map in which I wanted to show how space would have looked in terms of the configuration for Bonnie Prince Charlie invading um, England. And I did the map. I drew, drew it myself. And, you know, I, I was quite happy with it. Put it in, the, uh, put it in the, uh, the manuscript, they sent it off, the publishers accepted it, and then they rang me up after a bit, and they said, you know that map on page, whatever it was, they said, well, we, you know, when we were showing the book at the sales conference, people didn't like it. They feel that it should be precisely on north as the basic alignment. What I'd actually done is done an alignment which was slightly eccentric to north between Edinburgh and London, showing the quickest way for Bonnie Prince Charlie to march on London, and, you know. Well, you know, I had a real fight to keep the map that I wanted. Back to, sorry, can we focus this, please? Um, I think, actually, is that still the uprising of 1381? I think it is. In which case, let's go. Yes, we're going. Sorry, we're going. Here. Here we go. Canada again. Now, homesteading and agriculture in the West, 1872 to 1891. This is fantastic, again, because what you've got is on one spread all sorts of different ways, all sorts of different cartograms, all sorts of ways of spatially representing information. Okay? You've got pie diagrams. You've got a graph. You've got two different types of flow diagrams. You've got a spot or dot diagram. You've got the square one over there. You see? Absolutely brilliant. So what this has got here is really... Very high quality cartography. A, in a way, they're showing off. That's not a criticism. But what they're showing is how they can use a range of material. Each of the maps is designed to be what they regard as the most precise way of showing the kind of information that they want to show. All right? So, for example, if you're trying to depict elevator storage and wheat shipments, okay, you couldn't do that by a pie diagram. You know, there are different, what they're using is different forms. And this is really, and again, as I said, it's not boxed in, so it flows very well. It has the usual problem with the gutter, okay? Uh, bear in mind, actually, if you are doing slides of atlases, they are inherently very difficult, because if you go for the precision at the end, you're not going to get it in the middle, because you're not going to be allowed to break the spine of a book when you're doing the, so there is no inherently perfect way to take a slide of an atlas unless you actually break the atlas and take the pages out, which they will not like you do. I'm sure they didn't do that here. Um, but, uh, and of course, one of, the classic, one of the great problems with Canada is Canada is actually a jolly difficult shape to do in an atlas. Canada is extraordinarily extensive in a west-east direction, which means that the gutter always goes straight through the middle of it. Okay, some countries, uh, the same is true of the United States, some countries are superb. The shape is just right for a map, either because it naturally comes on the left or the right because they're up and down, or because what's in the middle is not important. Australia, for example, <laughs> you know, is, is absolutely per designed for a cartographer. But I'm afraid, I'm afraid Canada isn't. This is going back to Charles Paulin. Um, and it shows, as I've said, his willingness to engage with mapping the kind of topics you didn't find in 1932. In some ways, Paulin, in his own terms, is doing the kind of mapping that you get from the Historical Atlas of Canada. You know, obviously, in his own terms, because the cartographic techniques are limited, because what he could actually show is limited, because the amount of color choice and range he had was limited. But in his own terms, he was trying to do the same. And you see, the point about that map at the top is to show the greater density of colonial towns. That's, in other words, urban settlements that have a corporate identity, that have a chartered identity, and how that thickens up. And you can obviously see... Um, the, you know, one tot for each town. You can actually see how it thickens up in New England quite, quite considerably. Okay, he makes his point very explicitly. Now, 
I can tell you a bit about this one. I've picked ones I can tell you about because I think that's often interesting. Very few authors will ever come forward and tell you what went, what went wrong. This comes from another atlas I did, the um, Atlas of Early Modern Warfare. And this is a horrible map. But the point, really horrible map. But the point about this map is, is this. It was, a, it was a map in which I had terrible fights with the public. The publishers were doing this on the cheapest way possible because they were a packaging house. Now, again, you probably have no idea, unless any of you work in the book trade, you will have no idea how the books are produced that uh, you see. Uh, let me tell you one thing that absolutely will shock most of you. You do realize that when you see a pile of books in a bookshop and you think it's been put there because the bookshop thinks it would be a good thing for you to read that book, it's rubbish. Publishers give money to bookshops to actually display their books. If you're a publisher that won't give the money, you won't get your books displayed. So in other words, you are being totally manipulated. It's like, it's like soap powder, all right? It's, to so, you know, it's exactly the same as soap powder. Now, most atlases are published, not by, are published by publishers, but they're not produced by publishers. Publishers don't have in-house teams, most of them, of cartographers. What they're produced by is packaging houses. Packaging houses are a small group of people, one, two, three people, who essentially devise a project and produce it and sell it to the publisher, and the publisher publishes it under their imprint. The packager doesn't appear under the packager's imprint. The packager wants to get the money back as quickly as possible. Okay? They don't get the money back until the book is published, and quite frankly, they don't generally care very much about what is in it. Um, you, you won't be surprised to hear that, that because, of, because there is an actually large availability of cheap talent in England, England is the centre of the packaging house book trade in the world. Um, now, in this map, this is a fascinating one, they, they said to me we wanted a map of India in the 18th century of military history. So I said, great. I said, that's a good topic. It's not generally been done. Usually it's done from the point of view of the spread of Western power. I said, let's organise India as it would have looked to an invader. Right? The major invasions of India are the Persian invasion of 1739 and the Afghan invasions from the 1750s through to the 1760s. So I said, what we'll do is we'll have our central alignment from Ka Kabul to Delhi. In other words, you'll get the map as if you were standing at Kabul, that would be the bottom, and you'd go over to Delhi and the rest of India would be, as it were, spreading out before you. No. <laughs> That's how it started. And from there we went on, getting worse and worse and worse and that, and that shows you the kind of thing, nobody will ever tell you those kind of things, but those kind of compromises or disputes lie beneath most maps. Here we go back to quality. Um, but on, I say back to quality, it's worth saying that this historical atlas had state subsidy of $17.6 million, Canadian dollars. All right? That's let, al let alone the actual money they recouped through selling the thing, etc., and through private donations, enormous private donations. The whole of this will have cost over $35 million, whereas the average atlas, like the one I was showing you before, costs less than £10,000 to produce. So you're talking about very different production values, and you have to bear that in mind when you're seeing something. I mean, this is one of the triumphs of Canadian public sponsorship. That is why, incidentally, the Americans don't have an excellent historical atlas, because there's no public body that would be willing to put $17.6 million into a historical atlas. Again, here, managing the relief burden. Now, this is very interesting, this one. Well, I think most of them are interesting in the Canadian one, but this is very interesting, a simple one. You look at the earlier attempts at a historical atlas of Canada, a very good one, which came out at the beginning of the 60s, Unemployment in the, 90, in, the, in the Great Depression was not a topic you used to put in historical atlases. You know, it reflects the way in which historical atlases, the actual, what should you put in them? You know, what, if you were trying to map Canadian history in the 20th century, what to put? So the, here they're showing unemployment relief camp, work camps, direct relief funding from Toronto, the municipal relief burden, the growth of municipal debt, the destination of free clothing shipments, etc., etc., etc. Okay? In other words, a non-heroic account of the Canadian past. Even so, let me tell you one thing. If you look carefully at the historical atlas of Canada, I'll tell you one thing you won't see any map of, and that is um, Quip of Cars, Separatism and Terrorism. That wasn't acceptable in a publicly funded project. So even this, which is an excellent historical atlas, still has an agenda of what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable to show. And in fact, the subtext of this atlas is we're all Canadians together, rather than an atlas that dwells on the issue of provincial rivalry and provincial tension, which is just as much important in Canadian history. Okay? This map... 
Uh, this is 1992. 1991. And what they're showing here is the 1930s. Now, when you say what year is this, I take it, do you mean what year is the, is the map produced? Oh, 1991, yeah. But this is showing the 1930s here. This is a more conventional view of India from a British historical atlas of the early, um, early first decade of the, of, the, of the last century, showing the Mysore and Maharata wars. Those are the wars of the Mysores and, Mysores and Tipu Sultan of Mysore and the Maharatas with the Brits. And what it shows is what they, the Brits would have considered an acceptable topic to show, in other words, the spread of British control. So in other words, the topic is British territory, territory conquered by the British, native states in subsidiary alliance with or protected by Great Britain. I'm not sure many of them would have seen themselves as protected by... <laughs> and, you know, the subtext is very clear. And that was, a, that was the kind of map you produced, obviously, when history was an account of how you got the rise of the British Empire. Here, the, here we've got the Canadians again. Sea and livelihood in Atlantic Canada. Wonderful map. Wonderful spread. Showing... The other thing I particularly picked this one for is it shows you at very different scales. You've got the central one, fishermen and their catch, 1890, 1900. So that's the whole of New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and the St. Lawrence estuary. And then you've got down here the map in detail of a Newfoundland outport. So you're giving you very different scales of the same level of activity put on the same spread. Okay? Very high quality. And, of course, one of the costs is not just the cost of reproducing all this stuff and mapping all this stuff, which is extraordinarily expensive, there's actually the cost of doing the research as well. Um, more conventional kind of campaign mapping. Ah, now, this is one of my favourite ones. Uh, i tell you why I like this. As you will see in this map, when General Howe um, you know, his boo, I suppose, since we're in America, when General Howe sh sailed from New York to the Chesapeake, as you will see, he disembarked his troops at the very bottom of the, of the eastern shore, marched them across 10 miles and got them back into a ship and, marched up and sailed back up the Chesapeake. Well, as any of you will know if you're military historians, that is complete and utter rubbish. General Howe actually managed to sail all the way around. His ships didn't collide with the bottom of the shore, and they sailed up the Chesapeake. I pointed out to the map makers they had got it wrong. They said, we've already spent enough money on this atlas. It will cost us a bit of money to change the print. This is before computers. This is before computers. Now it would take you only a second on a computer. They said, we would actually have to reset the page, reset the thing. We're not going to do it. So there you have error beautifully represented <laughs> in, in a map. Okay. If you're, a trained, if you're a trained historian, and actually if you're a trained map user, you can actually spot the very high level of error in old maps. And often the people knew they were wrong, but the actual cost of rescribing, you remember you would scribe these on, sheet, the, on sheets and then photograph those, the cost of rescribing was immense. So errors would often be sustained. And then, of course, since so many maps were made by plagiarizing other maps, those errors were then, then... These days on computer, it's much easier. I mean, very, very briefly on the computer. Um, computer enables you, because the whole world is available in commercial packages and GPS systems, you can actually use any projection, any perspective, and you can, um, you know, manipulate the information. Great, absolutely wonderful. But there is one problem, as I say to my students, one of my courses is on historical cartography. And the problem, and I, I hope you will excuse my use of language, but I want to cre create for you the vivid, the vivid impression of being taught in Exeter. The problem, as I say to my students, is crap in, crap out. In other words, if the actual information that is mapped is not accurately depicted in a spatial sense, and then you feed it in the computer, all the computer is going to give you is a full sense of precision, but still inaccurate information. And that is true of map after map. It looks wonderful, but actually if the data set originally is wrong, in other words, where heresy was in 1500 or where the railway went in 1900, if you've actually got your original data wrong, then producing it in whiz-bang new cartography isn't going to make any difference. It's going to give you an even more dangerous sense that you've got it right. Suffolk again, much simpler Suffolk one, designed to show where greens and commons were more common. This goes back to 1826. This, is, this again is an atlas. This is an atlas. 
There's no maps in this atlas. It reminds us that atlases, this is a French ethnographical atlas of 1826, it reminds us that the kind of modern idea of what an atlas is, or even what a map is, is in fact um, one that people, I mean, for, for a lot of people, it was organized information. That was actually what an atlas or a map meant. Suffolk, again, you see wonderful precision here. Wonderful, wonderful precision. Times Historical Atlas of the World. This one gives you um, the advantages of, again, the arrow, completely overused arrow. That's a terrible map on the top right. Absolutely terrible map. But this one is a very interesting map. Very interesting, because by taking a... And remember, this is the 1970s, when you'd, well, these, these ideas were very modern. By taking a projection and locating it over the North Pole, you, what this map is designed to suggest to you is that there is a parallel but between Soviet... Or I should say Russian, sorry. Russian expansion across Siberia and expansion by the Brits and the French in North America. And it works. It brings together, in a common visual image two ideas which are usually kept totally apart on the page. So it actually works very well. I think that's it. Right, let me sum up one or two things and then we will take some questions. So I'll just be sum up one or two things then we'll take some questions. Right, mapping itself involves choice. Mapping involves choice for the present day and in historical terms. There is no right map in the sense of a map that is obviously the way to do it. There are maps that are more clearly wrong, but that is a different thing from saying that there is a map that is the only correct way to do it. It is worth bearing that in mind when you look at a map. The same thing is true of other bodies of information which to us seem so self-evident. Dictionaries, glossaries, encyclopedias. It's worth bearing in mind that choice is involved. Now, I'm not saying that for some reason of suggesting there's conspiracies under choice. That's a kind of naive, postmodernist, rather childish, left-wing approach. What I'm trying to do is actually say that those people who are interested in information, which we all are, whatever our walks of life, have to be involved, aware that there are practical problems. There's a practical difficulty. What to put in an atlas? what to put in an encyclopedia, and those involve choice, and the best way to do it is to make it clear to the people who are viewing or reading it or whatever that choice is involved. I hope I've also done that with this lecture. Thank you. Well, fire away. Sir. It seems to me that the computer has the potential, not just from the creation of the paper map, but to redefine and get to the two qualities. One is the interaction, so if I want to look at, say, reproduction as a panel on top of it or bottom of what you're pulling together, I can choose that. And it also gives you sort of time when it happens. Yep, it's wonderful for that. It, it's particularly wonderful for that. It can bring together data sets that you otherwise haven't been able to bring together without quite high cost, and also it gives you the element of dynamism. That is absolutely correct, but I'm not, all I was saying when I was criticizing the computer is not to say computers are bad, but just to say they demand precise information. Sorry, yeah, you... So the question is, is sort of the profession of cartographers... Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. There are maps on the screen. Um, you still need to have cartographers because the point is that uh, just, I mean, the military analogy is a clear one here. You can give any man a rifle, or woman for that matter, it doesn't make them a soldier. Um, in terms of cartography, you can make a map on your home computer, but unless you're aware of issues of projection, perspective, scale, key, all the kind of things that people are trained to do, uh, you don't actually use it in as in, use spatial depiction in as sophisticated a fashion as can be done. Right. Next, sir. Uh, uh, a mind of uh, Colonel Lazarus that I didn't mention that I was reminded of by your discussion of medieval and mapping of medieval and classical worlds are the penguin atlases, which are very primitive looking, but they they use they deliberately avoid clear demarcation, and even though they're still there's some of the Years ago, they came out of the fact that they were so, uh, I, I was wondering what you wanted to 
Right, well, actually, that's fine. The man that makes them is a friend of mine, and th this, this should tell you something about how mapping is open to everybody. He's a guy called Colin McEverty. He is, he's now retired in his, his mid-70s. He was an NHS psychiatrist. He's a doctor. It was his hobby, and in fact, he made a lot of money for it as well, but it was his hobby to make atlases, and he did it, and he did it exactly right at the level that interested him. You know, the, I mean, it's worth bearing in mind that map-making is both a skill but a skill that you don't need some priesthood to be inducted into. In other words, it's open to anybody to do it and to acquire the skills. Um, and I think one of the points I tried to make, I mean, there are lots of atlases I didn't discuss, but one of the points I was trying to make clear is you've got to be very careful of assuming that one atlas is necessarily better than another. What you have to consider is what purpose is it designed to fulfill. And that purpose, may I make clear, is commercial as much as academic or content words. I, I mean, an interesting thing here that I, I think is important for all of you who are interested in books um, is, as a general rule, people that write about books, whether it's historiography, which is a subject I'm interested in, or you know, a or, or, or whole range of, uh, of literary studies, give far little or too little attention to the role of commercial strategies, publishers, booksellers, uh, uh, the actual nature of the paper industry at the time, in explaining what you ended up with. There is this kind of ludicrous idea that people sort of free float, you know, and they're I it's sort of Hegelian idealism. They have these great ideas, and these ideas somehow manifest themselves, and then the notion of historiography is how we get from one idea to another. It's complete rubbish. You know, complete rubbish, So. There isn't a published book on the area of photography in a popular way. Uh, the modern system that is now used is based on satellite photography, which is a form of aerial photography, ob obviously. And the GPS systems mean that the information that comes from that is okay, encoded in computer forms, you know, in other words, the satellites, and that those are then sold to map makers. In fact, the basic source is American. I mean, as you may know, the Americans have sell at a slightly degraded level so that it shouldn't be as useful to other people for military purposes, the information that comes out of Defense Department satellites. And those, that information from Defense Department satellites is the basic information now used by mappers at that level. Now, aerial photography began before that, obviously, as you'll be aware. There was extensive aerial photography in the 19-teens, 20s, 30s, and 40s that was used in some specific types of mapping. For example, aerial photography played an enormous role in the mapping of Roman remains because the planes flying over were able to see through the crop patterns, you know, sites that had not been obvious on the ground. So if you look at, for example, something like the Ordnance Survey maps of Roman antiquities that came out in Britain in the middle decades of the 20th century, they were large, not completely, they were largely based on aerial photography. Um, aerial photography itself uh, was also very, very important in the spread of surveying. I mean, in essence, very, very crudely, this is very crude, the majority of the world's sur land surface outside large areas of the third world had been mapped by 1900. Mapped by people on the ground, surveyors on the ground. For large areas of the tropics, though, the original mapping was not done until it was done from the air. Okay? In areas, say, like New Guinea, a lot of Brazil, uh, you know, a, lot of, a lot of areas, the original mapping, and in a lot of these areas have never been mapped from the land. So that, in other words, mapping from the air was absolutely crucial for both historical purposes, what I was talking about, but actually even more uh, for the original surveying. Now, the basic information from the satellites maps not only the land, but also, more importantly in some respects, it enables us to provide accurate maps of the sea as well. Uh, because obviously, as you know, you can go straight through the water. Yes, sorry, sir, sir. No, yeah, yes, you, sir, you, sir. Yes, the, there are in fact, um, I, I mentioned one or two of them in my book, not that I'm urging you to buy the book for that reason, but, but there, are, there are one or two packages 
are computer packages that are sold that will produce maps on your screen at lapse periods. So in other words, it will show you uh, political maps, territorial boundaries at 10 or 20 or 30 years' time. There are also maps similar to that, for example, for the spread of population. Now, there's one major form of mapping. I mean, obviously, I've only been able to touch a little fragment of the subject. There's one major form of mapping that completely relies upon that, and that is the basic wireism of the American public, and that's called the Weather Channel. All right? You know... Uh, you know, and that entirely relies on time-lapse mapping. And, of course, it reminds us that time... There's a very good book by the American scholar Mark Monmounier on mapping weather. And what that reminds us of is, of course, mapping, in that sense, can be used both to depict the past but also to go forward. And weather mapping is a very good instance of that. So the actual dynamic continuum that is used, um, and there are all sorts of different techniques. I mean, Mounier is the best person to read on this. There are all sorts of different techniques. Um, essentially, one of the first uses of computers in any systematic fashion for mapping was the weather maps. All right? From the 40s onwards, they were experimenting with that. Um, so thank you. Very good question. Yes, sir. Well, there are all sorts of areas that are um, used by maps. I mean, if you think of photography as a form of mapping, I mean, for example, you can use satellite photography to shoot sea pollution spread, let's say an oil slick spreading across the ocean. You can use it to show environmental degradation. You can use it for all sorts of... In infrared mapping, you, as you're all aware, you, 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 let, you add... You have, with these cameras operating on a spectrometer which doesn't match the human eye, which gives you masses of information, and that the stuff is then fed through computers down to computer systems up in the sky, down to the computers on the ground. So in other words, you don't actually have to physically wait for a, photog for a photograph to be conveyed. Oh no, the range is enormous. Uh, briefly, on military history, because military history is one of my areas, you might even get them to invite me back. The problem in military history... The problem in military history with war is not so much beating your opponent. You know, if you're a sophisticated military, you ought to be able to do that. That's not the problem. The problem in war is war is a matter of imposing your will on others. I think it's too early to say whether this war has been as successful as destroying tanks might suggest. You know, yeah. No, 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 that's not it. I mean, no, no, I'm just making an intelligent point that is equally true. You shouldn't applaud that. That should be awkward, equally true for all wars. You know, I'm not, you know, that's equally true for all wars. There is, a, there is a specific problem that most people think about war in terms of, the, of weaponry. It's that analysis of war. Weaponry is an enabler. It is obviously, if you're involved in conflict, you would like to have a better weapon than your opponent. If you drive a car, you would like to have a better car than, you know, than, than, than as it were, the car that might have been available 30 years ago. Um, but that is not enough. That is not sufficient. I mean, that's all the, the point I'm trying to make. Yeah, sir. sir. Yes, with, yes, historical atlases, that's right, yes. Not so much that, but there are 3D modelings of history in which time is one of the continuums as well. There's a, a Swede called Hagerstrand has done that, and I mean, it's quite, it's quite complicated stuff. But there is an attempt to use 3D modeling, and in certain cartograms do use 3D, and time is then one of the continuums. Um, yes, madam. I wouldn't know what would be available in the United States, and also um, um, I, I wouldn't want to get involved in, 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 as it were, a commercial point like that. Um, I, 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 my point is this, that it's not so much the computer programming that is the key. What is the key is actually the accuracy of the information it rests on. And for most of time, the point I was making with that is the, the maps of, of Europe, it's not that there is one that is more accurate than the other. The sort form of accuracy comes from when somebody says to you, we can't actually map this. And commercial products don't, by and large, wish to do that. So there is a fundamental problem there. Look, how many experts, when you see interviewed on anything, I mean on modern affairs or anything, say, well, actually, I don't know. Now, the whole point is that, um, and that's field after field after field. You know, what did Jung mean then? Oh, I don't know. We don't know. We don't have the diary. You know, this kind of thing. So this is not, I'm not just talking about politics here. The point is that um, 
to my mind, the purpose of knowledge, I mean, obviously, there are utilitarian purposes. That's great. You want to have good machine tools. You need to know how to make them. That's great. But the purpose of knowledge in a more liberal fashion is to encourage people to a sense of humane skepticism. Not cynicism, but skepticism. And skepticism, in part, has to be about our capacity to actually understand things and our awareness that all forms of knowledge, including what I'm saying to you, are interim reports. It doesn't mean that they are less valuable. I mean, all that we could ever do is to do an interim report. It doesn't mean it's less valuable. But what it does mean is that its value in part rests on both being aware of itself as a system of knowledge and analysis and of conveying to others that there is obviously only so far that this can be taken. And I'm afraid to say most people, whatever their ideology, left, right, or center, won't do that. They know the answer. It is the preacher let loose in scholarship. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, Robinson was the American projection of 1961. It's very good. Uh, there's, if you're interested, there's an American book by a man called Schneider on different, what is called Flattening the Earth. It's on different forms of projection. It is excellent. It is the best available. Now, I mean, in essence, Robinson was, uh, Mercator is a 16th century projection. Mercator is, I didn't talk deliberately about the 16th or 17th century because there was only so much to cover. Mercator is perfectly good for his time. Okay? What he was doing was able in producing uh, maps that were, as it were, fit for sailors. In other words, maps that would show you as accurately as possible the maritime trajectory. But obviously, as maps of the world, they are deeply thought, as you correctly say. But the point is that the, the Robinson projection um, is better than the 19th century projections being used, like the Gull projection or the early 20th century bronze, like the Molewide. But there are all of the modern projections on offer, the Robinson, the Vanden Grinton, the Peters, all of them have this fundamental problem about the difference between the 3D shape and a 2D projection. Now, as you all may be aware, they'll often do different things at the edges. They'll add a tear, as it were, between the consonants, but there is no perfect way to do it. Robinson is perfectly good. It was for a long time endorsed by the American National Geographical Society, which is usually regarded as one of the best validators. It was, it's a very good one, but there is no perfect one. And the best thing, as I said, to read is the Schneider, which is excellent on this. Yes, madam. From the air? Oh, yes. I mean, you've got, um, for example, commercially in America, um, the, and the British were doing the same in the same period. There's marvelous maps in the 1860s called bird's eye maps. And the idea is that these are maps that theoretically show you what it would look like if you were a bird. I mean, they don't actually specify what height this bird is supposed to be flying at. But uh, these were very much sold at the time of the Civil War. So, for example, you get a bird's eye view showing Farragut's operations in, uh, you know, in the Mississippi uh, Delta. And in a sense, the bird, or let's say a low-flying aircraft, is as it were 100 miles above, 100 miles south of New Orleans, looking up the Mississippi. And it gives you that, and they're pretty good. They're actually pretty good. Uh, they were, um, you've got, I mean, I've seen lots of, there are loads of them. There's actually several good books. I'm sure they're in the library here, because this is an excellent library. There are several good books on mapping and the Civil War. Civil War, the Civil War brought an enormous amount of mapping, uh, particularly in the newspapers, uh, because people wanted to see where their relatives were, they wanted to follow the war, they were absolutely fascinated. Just as, for example, other American wars, the Spanish-American War brought an enormous spurt for, forward of mapping. Um, the, one of the difficulties is that accurate contour mapping as a matter of surveying is very, very difficult until the late 19th century for a number of technical reasons. So that what you're actually doing is you can pre produce an impressionistic map, which is what a bird's eye map is, but to actually produce it in a kind of precision, which is what we would now want to do it, is not really possible at that period. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, all our courses are optional. I mean, in other words, the way we, I mean, the, the British and the American systems, they're neither better nor worse, right? They're different. Um, and British universities will each 
we're under central, we're, I'm in effect a civil servant, we're under central government control to a certain extent, but we can actually, pre, we're not like the French, we can teach pretty well what we want as long as we can show that its educational quality is up to a certain level. So an, an academic will be expected to offer a certain number of courses, you know, I offer a certain number of courses, as long as I can persuade the teaching committee that they have intellectual validity, I'll be allowed to teach it. Now, in the case of historical cartography, the purpose of that, it, which is a mixed second, third year course for under, history, uh, history students, and I teach up to 40 students on that course, the purpose of it is not historical cartography as a geographer will teach it. A geographer's version of historical cartography is old maps. I'm, not in, I, I'm interested in old maps. I know a lot about them, but that's not my prime form of interest. My prime form of interest is how, at any one time, people have depicted what came earlier. So there's a difference, in my view, between historic mapping, which is old maps, and historical mapping, which is mapping of the past at any one time. And what I'm trying to do, get with the students to do is to um, do exercises, which we then discuss in seminars, and the practical problems of mapping topics which they choose having discussed with me. So that's, that's, and then they have to do some coursework, and I do some lectures. So, you know, it's, but it's, it's, it's just a different course, and I do courses on all sorts of things. Um, Works. To the best of my knowledge, it is the only course of that type taught anywhere in the world. There are, as I said, there are many courses on historic maps, but there's no other course, to the best of my knowledge, anywhere in the world on historical maps. Yes, sir. Very good question, sir. Um, in, the med in the medieval period, I mean, to be fair, I, mean, I was giving you all sorts of shortcuts. In the medieval period, there are all sorts of maps, but the, type, the most dominant map is the T-map. The map, as you know, with Jerusalem as the center of the world and with the three continents form it. So in other words, it's a circular map with a T in between, and the three parts of the map are occupied by Asia, Europe, and Africa, or their understanding of Asia, Europe, and Africa. Um, from Europe, obviously looking towards Jerusalem, you were looking east. So you were making a statement if you put Jerusalem at the top, okay? There were, obviously, though, other scales of maps. For example, the maps, let's say, in Britain, not that Britain's particularly important, but the maps in Britain, say, Matthew Paris or Gough, which were road maps or Britain or route maps of Britain, which, in fact, in no way related to Jerusalem and in no way were taking part in that kind of intellectual agenda. Now, in the early modern period, they move away from that intellectual agenda for a number of reasons. The most important reason is the fact that they now have to map a completely different world. And there are actually enormous organizational problems of deciding. I mean, mapping is changing. We think map things change today faster than ever before. Rubbish. You think of the problems of actually mapping between 1490 and 1550. You know, I mean, at a time, and the pace of change is enormous. And, and there are a whole host of reasons to put north at the top. One of them, of course, is for navigational maps to do with the magnet and all the rest of it. But one of them is also organizational. Um, you know, that this is the way appears to be the way to present the world. Um, and of course, uh, once you sailed west and just came to the east, as it were, uh, and everybody could, as you know, intellectually they knew that was the case already. They didn't need the age of discovery to discover that. But what the age of discovery did was underline it to an extent that it became an organizational principle. And if you're sailing around the world, going, you know, then you can't really have the east on the top. Well, I mean, you could do, but it would look at a very different kind of world. Uh, bear in mind, again, I've only talked, touched at fragments on this. We're talking here about the mapping of the world. One of the major early modern projects is the mapping of the spheres. You know, this is an uh, Earth um, globe. Remember, a lot of early globes were not maps of the globe of the Earth. They're maps of the stellar system, as seen from Earth. Interestingly enough, that is also true of um, East Asian society and South Asian society. If you're interested, uh, and I'm sure they're here, the current major project in the world on the history of cartography is the um, histories of cartography being published by the University Press of uh, Chicago. And they've so far done um, early and medieval, classical and medieval Europe, early and classical China, early and classical South Asia. And the point is that classical and early South Asia and East Asia do not have this mapping so much of the earth, but what they do have, particularly with the Indians, is an absolute fascination with mapping the spheres. You know, with mapping, and that is mapping human beings and how they relate to, in, a, in many senses, their religious interpretation. Um, and we've got to bear in mind, I am talking to you and you are listening to me in terms of a dominant secular model. But bear in mind that attempts psychologically and intellectually to understand the human condition vis-a-vis -vis in a spatial sense, as much was to do with your position vis-a-vis -vis heaven and hell, 
as they were to do with your position vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, sort of Washington or Naples. And again, we've got, it's very difficult to recreate that intellectually. And I'm, cut, I'm taking so many shortcuts. It's really, you know, it's, it, it, you know, but there are all these kind of, you know, cognate issues here. Yes, madam. Yes. Um, well, of course, the new left, I'm not a new left thinker, as you may have gathered. The new left discourse, which in fact is rather old left, it was the discourse of the 1980s and 1970s. The new left discourse is, J.B. Harley was the leading figure there, and other Brit, incidentally. Um, the, 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 the discourse there was that mapping was a form of appropriation. It was linked to the idea that you gave your names to the landscape, etc., etc., etc. The problem with that approach is while it has a certain degree of truth, it is also ludicrously crude. I mean, you know, it is ludicrously crude. In other words, the idea that knowledge is simply a form of power, which is what this is where it comes from, it's Foucault and Derrida, the, knowledge that, the notion that knowledge is simply a form of power is a very, very simplistic account. See, clearly, in some areas, knowledge is a form of power. And in some areas, knowledge is a way that you structure time, space, human beings, life, in order to get your way, like any system of language. But, of course, like any system of language, it is more than that as well. And that's the problem. This, is, this takes what, in a sense, is an obvious point. But there is no, in the case of mapping, an obvious point. There is no obvious way to do this, so the map will tend to reflect our values. You know? And then that makes it a conspiracy. Uh, and it's too simple to make conspiracies out of obvious points. Um, you know, it actually underrates one's own intelligence and that of the readers, in my view. One more question, madam. Why, there, are, there are historical atlases of the United States. There's a recent one from the National Geographical Society or the Reader's Digest. I've got it at home. What I'm saying is they haven't produced one of the research quality of the, of the one for Canada. Or, uh, and that is because, yes, you would require money. Interestingly enough, the closest the Americans came was for the bicentennial. At the time of the bicentennial, the NEH put money into a project for historical atlases, of which one volume came out, the Atlas of Revolutionary America which is a superb atlas, very, very good. And then they lost interest. Um, there are individual atlases, historical atlases, that are very good. Helen Hornbeck Tanner did a historical atlas of the Great Lakes Indians, which is wonderful, based on a lot of scholarship, very interesting. There's an atlas called the Californian Water Atlas, which is an amazing atlas showing the development of the water industry in California. But there are large areas which have never been mapped. Uh, one of the reasons, which I haven't got into, is because America, and this is an amazing thing given that this is a continent pretending to be a country, America has never really got into the art of geography. Geography is one of the subjects that is worst covered at American universities. Um, there are some individual brilliant geographers. It's not that the Americans can't do it. There are some brilliant geographers. A man called Menick wrote a multi-volume book, book called The Shaping of America, which I richly commend to you. It is one of the great triumphs of historical geography. But the practicality is there are only a tiny number of Americans. American geographers, particularly historical geographers. So in a sense, it's part to do with a culture which has never put geography as taking a prime role in the school or higher education system, which I think is a pity. No, my pleasure. Is that all right?